and welcome to the next segment of VGM Together. Uh, I'm Zeynep Dili, the Library Branch Director of Washington Metropolitan Gamer Symphony Orchestra, and this is Jamin Morden, Music Director, my boss, who doesn't like it when I call him my boss, but... And we are going to talk about how we get the music we play every season onto the music stands of WMGSO. So let's talk a little bit about how this all started. In the beginning, when WMGSO was first formed, we did not have an administrative structure, we only had the board. And the vice president was responsible for collecting the pieces from arrangers and distributing them to the players. The uh, pieces went through the review of the music director, uh, who might have had uh, comments and edit requests before the season. But the review process itself was not very detailed. So this led to sort of the next point here, which was this process was appropriate for the orchestra at the very, very beginning when it was relatively small. But the problem with this is this led to two pretty severe bottlenecks here. When the vice president received new arrangements, there was not really much they could do with them. Uh, so if they were good arrangements, great, we can play this. If they uh, were struggling with certain things, then it was a little more difficult to, to change anything. And the music director had to look at everything that came in. So if we got those arrangements that weren't quite ready to be put on the stands uh, of just the uh, arrangers themselves, the music director had to be in charge of all of that. And especially several seasons in, when we started to get more and more music, having that bottleneck for the incoming music turn into a very real problem. So in the summer of 2015, this is three seasons in or so, uh, in an admin meeting that I was also attending, the first admin position was proposed. And the person who proposed it, a good friend of ours, Sarah Zeglin, actually was proposing three positions in one, uh, the ensemble manager, a concert producer and the library manager and everybody reacted as this is too much work i went home thought about it and drafted a position description for the library manager for our board uh, throughout the fall and in january 2016 after being interviewed for the position i was assigned as the first library manager However, there was a little problem with all of this. Uh, remember when I said the first proposed positions was actually three positions in one? What I proposed as the single library manager position in the 2020 view of hindsight should really have been for a department, not for a single administrative position as well. The list of functions and the operational system we are going to go over in a little bit requires the efforts of more than one person. So over the years, some um, improvements were made that helped with that. In 2019, the arranger resources manager position was created to interface with our arrangers and to do the direct hand holding a little bit more while I could focus on the music itself as a library manager. And uh, also throughout that period of time, a proto review was for review team was formed so that the music director was not the only person reviewing the incoming pieces anymore. All of this helped, but it still wasn't enough. And during the summer and fall seasons of 2021, when we were just coming out of our virtual period, along with everybody else, uh, with the support of the board, the music director, and the ensemble manager, uh, we codified the structure and functions of a library branch. And throughout the fall, we opened the, this up for applications, sent out the job descriptions, had applications, interviewed people, and staffed the library branch finally fully by uh, January 2022. And this is what we evolved into. These are the functions that the library branch fulfills. I just want to point out right away that the, the, maybe the most true thing on this page is at the very bottom right of it, not a one-person job. Um, Zainab was for several years doing all of this. And so we found ourselves once again in that sort of bottleneck circumstance where 
Uh, she was in charge of talking to new arrangers, getting the, the originals, getting the, the parts, or, uh, editing things, and, and uh, organizing the reviewers and everything like that. Um, one of the things that uh, I want to remind everybody is that the Washington Metropolitan Gamer Symphony Orchestra is a community orchestra. This is nobody's full-time job. And so one of the things that, and this is sort of happening in the background, along with the, the library branch becoming a full-fledged department, one of the things we were trying to really um, do was make sure that nobody in the organization had to spend as much time on the organization as they did on their full-time job. So uh, this, what, this uh, setup that, that Zainab made was deeply appreciated. So once I calculated and in the peak period of my involvement with the orchestra, I was doing the equivalent of a quarter time job for the orchestra in, in yeah. you know, hourly, yearly hours. So this is true. So we have to handle the music and we have to support the arrangers as the library branch. So the functions we perform are reviewing new repertoire, doing both musical editing and copy editing on these formatting and engraving or giving the arrangers support to do the formatting and engraving and then distributing the music that has been chosen to play to the players at the beginning of a season, perform archival services, keep track of in-season changes, support the concert branch by advising the music director and choir director on what's available for each season and assisting with the uh, piece selection, supporting the album branch for helping uh, select and or put together a repertoire for an album. We'll talk more about those later. For the arranger services, maintaining the arranger emailing lists, documentation, which we will give more details about later, running workshops, organizing training materials, and in between, there is the general cultivating music for the orchestra functions, which are like soliciting arrangements and or recruiting new arrangers. Um, deciding that we need an arrangement of Terra's theme from Final Fantasy VI to pick a non-random example and ask somebody to arrange that. And also curating the repertoire over the years and working on large collaborative projects or specific collaborative projects about which we'll talk a bit more later. So yeah, like Jamin said, this wasn't a one person job. And until this structure was formed, this is the library branch as it is today. Parts of it always had to be on the back burner. Thankfully, now it is not. Under the library branch director, which I am holding now as a mostly coordinative and um, big picture position, I have two branches, the music services branch, comprising of the repertoire editors and the music coordinator and archivists and the Arranger Services branch comprising of the Arranger Services manager. Each of these people uh, who are holding administrative positions are supported by uh, volunteer support teams. The Repertoire Editors Direct and Coordinator Review team. The Music Coordinators get support from an editing engraving team. The Arranger Services manager can tap specific people to develop workshops or training materials or to co coach arrangers that require them. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about what each of these people do in a little as well. Moving on, excuse my mouse, but why do we do this in such a complicated fashion? So why don't we just get the music, distribute the music, we are done <laughs> as it used to be in the beginning? Uh, there are three reasons for that. One is the obvious reason for video game orchestras. In a regular symphony orchestra, um, not regular, what's the word there? Uh, Conventional yes. symphony orchestra. Um, the library manager, is essentially the person responsible for acquiring music, music from rental services or publishing mm -hmm. houses, keeping track of the copies and distributing them. We cannot do that. We cannot source music commercially. The music most times does not exist commercially. And for what does exist, we don't want to. We want our own arrangements. Right. 
unfortunately there is there is no video game music equivalent uh, to IMSLP, the International Music Score Library Project, which if you are a fan of conventional symph symphonic music, I highly recommend you check out because there, it is the largest available library of music in the public domain that uh, you can get your mitts on. Uh, obviously, we can't do that. And uh, the majority of our arrangers are performing or non-performing members. And we also receive external submissions, including some cold submissions from all over the mm -hmm. world now. I am so happy about this. And we program them when we can. But we can't just go and buy music. The non-obvious reason is that the arranger to symphony hall stage pipeline is more complicated than what most people first think of when they think about arranging video game music. There are a lot of more and different concerns than when you're arranging music for yourself and when you're, or when you're arranging for your own band mm -hmm. in which you also play. And to complicate matters even more, the majority of our arrangers, hi, do not have formal orchestration training. To, to foreshadow a discussion we're going to have a little bit later, the simplest way to say this is every new voice that you add to your arrangement ramps up the complexity uh, a little bit a little bit more and when we are writing arrangements for our full ensemble of uh, standard woodwind section plus saxophones plus uh, the standard brass section percussion strings and choir you suddenly have a a, a vertical music score that is literally does not fit on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper unless you, you know, want the conductor to be reading it with an, an eyeglass. So we'll, we'll talk more about those challenges later, but, you know, if you're writing something for your band with, you know, five or six folks in it, you're not going to have to deal with that. And that links to the third um, reason. The end product can be complex. No, I mean, it can really be more complex than what you're thinking. Because there is no a priori upper limit, we don't put any prescriptions on our arrangers. We try to, as much as possible, play whatever they want us to play. Mm -hmm. But that music should be, needs to be, has to be reproducible and interpretable by real live musicians who are, for a community orchestra, mostly not professionals, in finite research time. Uh, sorry, finite rehearsal time. <laughs> So Rehearsal is a type of research. Simple example here. This is a transcription of what you are about to hear. Sector X from Star Fox 64, Koji Kondo. <laughs> When you have that turned into this, You can see I wasn't kidding about the vertical size of the score. And when this is done by somebody who has learned how to do it by basically doing it instead of formal training, we do need to have a lot of support and post-production for lack of any better term. I need to point out that all of the arranging and comment examples that I am going to give here are going to be from my own arrangements because that way I didn't have to get permission for anybody else to, um, for me to reveal their maybe things that are in draft form or that they are not very happy with. So let's talk a little bit or start talking a little bit about how that support and post-production is shaped. So you want to arrange for WMGS, so great, please do. The first thing uh, you will need to do is to go look at our webpage 
where we have a main resources page under that Air England Submission Guidelines page uh, that you can find for after two clicks of get involved on our main web page. In that arrangement submission guidelines, you will find what you need to have to submit an arrangement to us and links to our eligibility guidelines, which is to say what pieces can you arrange that we will consider programming. There are some things that we will not consider. Uh, in general, the music has to be original music written for a video game. Mm -hmm. There are edge cases such as uh, music written for movies that directly follow from video games or music that were licensed or adapted into a video game such as classical pieces of music mm -hmm. that appear in games. And there are definite no-nos which are like uh, music that were licensed as part of the game mechanics none of rock band's uh, pieces are eligible. Right. Uh, however, that Zelda rhythm game has original music, so those would be uh, eligible. And anything that comes from the game of the movie is out because I do not want to tangle with Disney's lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> you guys think all. Nintendo is hard on it. So I am oh, very, man. very sad that we don't get to play John Williams. We don't get to play John Williams. We don't get to play John Williams. You will also find our formatting guidelines, about which a little bit more later. And you will find a very important spreadsheet, the works in progress list, where we list uh, the arrangers list, the things that they are now working on or are planning to work on in the near future. Uh, that list is really, really important because I do never want to have a repeat of the dueling Metroid medleys incident of 2018 ever again. Uh, you will also find our current instrumentation list. Uh, which, like Jamie mentioned before, is pretty exhaustive. Mm -hmm. But if there is something in there that you want that isn't listed, talk to us. Yeah, we will let you know. With it, within reason. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up very briefly here is is to say that when we're programming our concerts, we really like to try to have pieces that feature or that that include everybody involved. So we we really like our big full orchestra, plus saxes, plus choir. We like that sort of stuff. Uh, we do feature smaller groups in our concerts as well. Uh, we had, uh, uh, was it spring or fall last season when we did the, the string orchestra piece? Doesn't matter. We've done string orchestra alone, chamber orchestra, acapella choir stuff, but in general, we like to try to s stick to the, the full ensemble. And um, this is a preview of something we're gonna talk about a little bit later. But when you're looking at the instrumentation list and you're, you're, you're considering what we have and don't have, you know, it, it's a pretty big list. So we can probably do just about whatever you want with it. Uh, so when you're writing for us, you know, and you're about to email us, just ask yourself truly, do you absolutely have to have Hecklephone solo in your piece? Because we will, especially if the piece is very, very good, we'll try to acquire one, you know, but we may ha already have an instrument that can handle that whatever the, the particular effect or, or musical idea you're going for. We may already have it, so just, just something to consider. So the next thing you need to do is to email resources at wmgso.org and say, I want to be added to the arrangers list. You will sign an NDA and then if you want, you will have access to our Discord server channels for arrangers where you can get live feedback and advice and chat to other arrangers. Uh, before, before we move on, I apologize to interrupt, but uh, uh, Dark Painted Ruse, who is our secretary, by the way, uh, added a very, very, no, development director. She used to be secretary, excuse me. Added something very important in the chat. We also accept a cappella pieces for the choir only, as we always do at least one a cappella piece per each uh, major concert. Thank you for your time. Zainab, continue. You will get edit access to the works in progress list and uh, access to the arranger's emailing list where you can get voluntary peer review if you would like when your piece is ready to completion. Uh, you will peer off mentoring requests and opportunities, group arrangement opportunities mm -hmm. and workshops. And we also have some how-to guides uh, on our website that are currently and constantly in development. May I say one more thing Please. on this slide? Um, 
If you are an up-and-coming arranger and you're interested in doing more writing, uh, or if, even if you are what we call a baby arranger and you really would like to get into this, I cannot recommend the arrangers list and these um, support systems enough. The arrangers email list uh, is basically anybody who's asked to be on that list and has written for WM or wants to write for WM, and there are some extremely talented people on that list, not only at arranging, but also at coaching arrangements. Um, I've been writing for, for WMGSO for 10, like 10 years now. I don't know if that's exactly the number, but whatever, it's been a long time. And a lot of the best tricks that I've learned, I've learned because I've sent my arrangements to that email list and uh, gotten feedback that was really, really useful. Not only that, but the, the workshops that we will be doing uh, don't have to be local. Uh, the, this summer we had an arrangers workshop uh, that was entirely online through Discord, where we would share our pieces with everybody and get comments from um, the arrangers who were, were participating in the workshop, from you know people who've been with the group a long time, like me, to brand new folks who had just heard of us that year. So this this list is is half of one slide, but it, it really is a, a a huge, huge wealth of resources and, and support that you should really consider if you're interested in writing for us or for anybody uh, in terms of video game music. So the piece is ready for review. You are submitting. What do you need to submit? You need to submit the score for review will be preferred transposed and non-transposed preferably. Section parts, conceptual recordings, uh, references to the source material if you feel they are relevant, and arranger's comments if you want that describe um, what you were trying to achieve either mm -hmm. with that arrangement in general or in specific parts of it. The sectional parts somehow sometimes confuse people, so I have an example here. This is essentially a reduced score that only has the four horns, three trumpets, uh, two trombones, bass trombone, and tuba. And also known as our brass section. That's essentially yeah. to help the brass section leader to not have to skip between 15 PDFs to review yeah. the relevant parts. And also, uh, Jamin was saying, if you can tell which arrangement this is, 10 points, it is cheating if you can read the full <laughs> We'll Absolutely. talk about the performance notes a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to move on. Uh, please. And then the arrangement goes into review, which is a process coordinated by the repertoire editors. What they do is to take all those submitted parts, put them into a folder, create a spreadsheet for comments, and give access to the review team. Our review team currently consists of the music director, choir director, the library branch director, our album director, the repertoire editors, our section leaders and also specialist reviewers for specific instrumentation mm -hmm. that nobody else might know that much about. Especially, like, I don't know anything about how to review harp. Our harp, harp is thus. Yes, harp is a very specific beast, and if you don't know a lot about it, having an actual harpist look at your music and go, I have suggestions, is incredibly useful. Ian Martin, I think, yes, uh, email me. Mm -hmm talk. The comment spreadsheet of which I'm going to show examples in a second is extremely useful because reviewers can see and elaborate on each other's comments. The arranger can see all of them and the arranger when they are doing the revisions can respond if they choose not to change something based on a suggestion that wasn't a request or requirement then they can say why. After all of the comments are in the repertoire editors notify the arranger about this and after the revisions come in, they double check to make sure that all the required revisions were done. <clears throat> so, uh, what does the review consist of? What are we looking at? I am going to first shortly talk about the second one of this, and for the first one, I'm going to hand it off to Jamin. Um, the playability review is essentially, this is going to the section leaders who think about a little bit about, is this idiomatic? for the instruments in my section and a lot about 
is this playable for the instruments in my section? If something is technically too difficult, they will let you know. If you are asking the clarinetist to hold it backwards, they will let you know. And um, this is actually part of our section leader duties, so it might not be right to say that the section leaders are volunteers for doing this, but they are heroes for doing it anyway. For the musical review, I showed here two examples of the comments that I have received for two of my arrangements this season. And if you can read them, great. If you can't, Jamin is going to talk a little bit about what we are looking into. Sure. Anyway. Um, so I will say right off the bat, uh, we only have until 2.45. Yes. So when I start rambling, just stop me. Um, there's a lot that we can worry about even when you've managed to write a part that everybody can play. Um, one of the big ones is balance. You, one of the things that everybody loves, or uh, anybody who has a similar taste in music to me, is uh, the sound of a low flute. For example, the alto flute. If you've heard our uh, recording of Climbing the Ginso Tree or you've listened to the Ori and the Blind Forest soundtrack at all, you know that it has that wonderful sort of soulful feeling that's so beautiful and, 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 and wonderful and nobody on God's green earth will hear it if you, if you orchestrate it with anything else whatsoever. And so one of the things we look at is, is like, where are you putting the melody and what's happening alongside it? If you're putting your melody in a single alto flute against the entire string section, you're not going to hear it. If you're putting the melody in all three trumpets against just about anything, then you have a much better chance of that getting heard. The other idea is we're looking for um, what's happening between different voices and between different sections. One of my big uh, uh, soapboxes that I will stand on is your music should be as exciting vertically as it is horizontally. Um, a lot of folks make the mistake of jumping straight into writing for the full group. And I will tell you, if it's your first rodeo, jump on the little bull first. Write a string quartet, write a woodwind quintet, something like that. Because a lot of times when you listen to any piece of music, video game music, classical music, whatever, there's really only three to five things going on. If you're listening to a Beethoven symphony, um, you'll have your melody happening in the strings. You'll have pads in the woodwinds holding out chords. You'll have a bass line happening. And really, that's about it. When you translate that to a full score, one of the mistakes we see happening a lot is you put, you know, your melody into the violins, and then you put your uh, harmony pads into, let's say, the clarinets, that's good, and then you put your bass line in the double bass, and now there are 25 more staves for you to fill. And your, your intention is that this be the big, loud, shout chorus part of the song. Well, there's ways that we can help you fill out those, uh, the, the, that vertical space that so that... That doesn't involve Control-C, Control-V. Right, that does not involve Control-C, Control-V. Now, that being said, Control-C, Control-V is my best friend. Uh, it, it is so very helpful, especially when you really know how to use it. Um, I'll, I'll, one more. When you're writing for the full orchestra, and that vertical orchestration does help, consider, consider what you're writing and for whom and what the individual part looks like when, you're, when you export it. Um, if you are going to write a piece of music that features exactly four notes in the tuba, they had best be the greatest four notes of that whole arrangement. Otherwise, ask yourself the question, do I really, really need this voice here? Or can I potentially put this voice somewhere else uh, and have them have more to do? Uh, I don't want to keep going if because we're, we're, we're running low on time, but there's there's... I mean, I can, infinite, we can, we can talk forever. A lot of these things that Jamin mentioned aren't things that you know ahead of time if you haven't yes. written for an orchestra before. And even if you have, this is a lot to think about. Some things do get forgotten or ignored. Every an single orchestral arrangement is a very complex system. Every single thing I mentioned there and every single thing mentioned on here is something I learned because I've made, the, I've made that mistake. <laughs> so, so yes, we're very familiar. <laughs> 
Therefore, those are all the things that the musical review process mm -hmm. is going to catch and help you fix. And then once that is done, once the revisions are approved, uh, you are going to send your piece in for final submission. I don't want to just read through the page here, but uh, here is what we need to require, uh, what we're going to need for the publication, and you're going to get that list when it's ready for submission mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, however, even at this stage, it might not be ready for publication or distribution if it's going to be performed that season. A proofreading uh, stage and an engraving revision, I said may be necessary in the slide, it is necessary. Mm -hmm. And this is overseen by our music coordinators, the proofreading process, the packaging and the archiving. And uh, after that, we publish this on the internal webpage if it is going on to that season's program, and we keep track of revisions performed in season. So why the proofreading? Our ultimate goal as a library branch is to make the rehearsals as easy as possible. Our ultimate goal in this aspect, I should say. So the music mm -hmm. can be difficult. Interpreting it well can be difficult. Reading the music should not be difficult and should not take one nanosecond more than necessary in rehearsal. So, are all the parts there? We've had problems where uh, somebody came to me and said, where is the glockenspiel part? It's in the score. I don't have a part for it. Help. Are the page turns well placed? You want to be kind to your players. Are there cue notes if there are a lot of rests in the part? You want to be kind to your players. Are the notes, the accidentals, spelled correctly? You want to be kind to your players. Is the beaming well to make the rhythms easy to read? Be kind to your players. Are there enough bar numbers? You want to, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the line breaks should make sense. You don't want, if it's possible, to break the line in the middle of a huge hairpin. There might be missing dynamics because you saw the 60 parts there and maybe you didn't put the dynamics into each part, so... Same with articulation, everything might not be consistent between parts, so we need to make sure when they're exported individually, they are. And the general readability overall, these are some of the things that we look at to improve that. I just wanted to add that this ultimate goal on the right side of the screen here is a, a wonderful mantra for every person involved in the process. Here, this is in terms of the library branch, but if you want to write and arrange, you know, you want to think about that in your arranging as well in terms of, first, of, first and foremost, express your musical ideas. And just underneath that in terms of priorities is, am I expressing these ideas as playably as possible, because the one major thing I have learned over these past 10 years, especially with the community group, is the easier your musical ideas are to uh, perform, the better they will sound. So, thank you. Of course. And then there are, this is what happens to a single arrangement uh, when it is put into review or when it is submitted to us. And then there are the other functions of the library branch that I said that we would talk a bit more about later. This is later. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a big part of what I do as a library branch director, the repertoire cultivation and curation. Organizing the um, arrangement, collaborative arrangement usually, of things like symphonic suites. Mm -hmm. For instance, the one that we are performing on November 19th, 2022 at Prince George's Community College Performing Arts Center at 7 p.m. Uh, a seven movement suite from Final Fantasy VII. It's going to be real good. It was also in planning for about a year and a half and uh, five arrangers contributed to it. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing takes coordination and preparation. Other large-scale co collaborations, we are collaborating with an external guest uh, musician this season for the first half of the concert. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say more about that now. Uh, they, they know who they are. They know who they are, <laughs> and they are around here, and it is going to be very exciting. We had to have a concerto written for that. Mm -hmm. That took coordination. 
uh, recital programs. We just had our first solo instrument recital for which the arrangements were all written within the previous mm -hmm. three months after our arranger services manager, arranger resources manager put out a call for arrangers to arrange for that specific instrumentation. I believe from some first time arrangers as well, is that correct? As well, yes. There you go. Uh, keeping track of what's in the pipeline, that uh, works in progress list. I also keep an eye on that because uh, that allows me to provide the assistance I need to provide for each season's program selection, which is happening more and more in advance as things uh, progress here. I also provide assistance in long-term large-scale project planning. Like I said, this particular thematic concert was planned for about the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then there are uh, functions that are currently in development. We are trying to move our archive from a folder structure to spreadsheets to a database, searchable database. We are trying to automate the submission review process instead of you emailing me and me emailing the repertoire editors. Mm -hmm. All of this is going to do, be done through a web interface, hopefully soon. Uh, we are also trying to create a similar parallel process for small ensemble pieces. They don't always need to be reviewed because they are mostly for people writing for themselves and for their bands, but sometimes they aren't. And also we want to make the existing archive for people to just pick up and play, pick, play pieces wider, yeah. keep maintaining it, and... Uh, create that resource for our performance as well. So, but really, why though? Why all this work? What has that earned us over the years? Well, this is a discourse screenshot from this past June, where I am giving the tear smile about there being 114 at that point of full orchestra, a cappella, and reduced orchestra pieces that we had performed. That is not what's in the library. What's in the library is more. This is stuff that we have actually performed. And by November 19th, this is going to be, that number is going to be 124. Mm -hmm. It's an achievement, a huge achievement, when you think that this is all being supported and brought up by volunteers for volunteers. But quantity isn't quality, but I can also say that our quality has kept improving significantly over the last years, last five years or so. And since I'm just making that assertion, I will give Jamin three minutes to support that assertion. Thank you. A um, couple of things have been happening, especially since we came back after the, uh, the pandemic. First of all, let me say that once somebody has written arrangements for us, they tend to continue writing arrangements for us. So I'm one example of this. I started writing arrangements uh, for that first season back in, what was it, 2013, 14? 14. Uh, and I've stuck with it and I've learned a lot and I've become a better arranger through it. A lot of people have followed my same sort of pipeline there. Not only that, but our arranger resources have gotten better. So if you're coming on as a brand new arranger, then uh, you have many, 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 many more resources available to you than I did when I first came on. On top of that, and this is the last point I'll, I'll, I'll make you because I know we're running low on time, is that the orchestra itself is growing. The orchestra itself is pulling in more uh, talented players. And I mean, honestly, some of the, the, the returning players also have, have uh, hit the practice rooms harder because I think they're so glad to be back after... Uh, uh, after the pandemic, um, and so the arrangers listen to that and they go, oh, instead of having two good cello players, we now have five. We have an actual section there, and so we can now write for that, and you, st you see the, the expansion of all of our sections reflected in our arrangements in uh, more options for the arranger to write for, in more flexibility for who can do what, and for more... Uh, inventive musical moments that you can do when you have uh, stronger sections across the orchestra. I think I will leave it there. Is that is that enough? That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And to tie to that, uh, 
I, before I talked about the library branch goals in terms of engraving, or what we focus on when we're producing the sheet music, that is, reading should not be difficult, rehearsal should be as easy as possible. These are the overarching goals of the library branch that I want to talk about in this slide and the next one, though. The Washington Metropolitan Gamer Symphony Orchestra is officially, by the IRS, an educational nonprofit organization. And our most stated mission is to educate the general public about the breadth and depth of video game music, to bring video game music to classical music listeners, and to bring classical music to video game fans. That is our fundamental mandate, but that is not our only mandate as an educational institution. Part of what we do, and this is all the library branch does, is to enable and empower arrangers. I am going to go a little bit personal here. An actual symphony orchestra is playing the actual notes I wrote in my actual computer is not an experience that I ever expected to have in my life. I'm an electrical engineer, okay? <laughs> and it is an indescribable feeling. It is a truly extraordinary thing. And I believe that this is the case for even the people in our arrangers list who are professional composers. Because think about it, how do you get the opportunity to have a symphony orchestra perform your music? This isn't something that you can just go rent somebody to do. It's an extraordinary, out there, outstanding opportunity. And what the library branch is trying to do is to help the arrangers make the most of it. So my goal is to di bi-directional. I want to provide the WMGSO musical leadership and the performers with the highest quality music that is ready to perform. And you do. That is, <laughs> and my, my team does. Yes, you do and your team does. And the other direction is to provide the WMGSO arrangers with the support and production system that will allow them to present the best arrangements they can, that will allow them to express their ideas in the best way it can be expressed through the medium of symphonic music. And again, my team, I believe, has been succeeding in that. So now I have to give thanks. First, I have to thank VGM together for letting us do this, inviting us to do this, in fact. Uh, this was their idea, and I am really glad that I got to think about this in this much detail and write it out and present it all of, to all of you. And I would like to thank my incredible, incredible team, the repertoire editors Ben Ryer and Thomas Ashcombe, the music coordinators and archivists uh, Charlotte Johnson and Alex Edwards, our arranger services manager Dan Serino, my extraordinary review team, most of whom are doing this, no, all of whom are doing this on top of their regular duties as administrative mm -hmm. members or performers and or performers. And finally, to all of our arrangers, thank you. Please keep writing for us. <laughs> if you haven't written for us yet, if you don't know you're a WMGSO arranger yet, I'm telling you right now, email library at wmgso.org, email resources at wmgso.org, and come see us on November 19th and maybe also watch our socials for other announcements related to that because there are going to be big announcements related mm -hmm. to that. I think I have two minutes to take any questions, uh, but if we can't make it, feel free to email me any questions. And thank you, Jamin, so much. You are very welcome. And I am, I am very happy to be here and, and, and be a part of this. Uh, obviously, WMGSO has been a big part of my life uh, the past 10 oh. years, so <laughs> yes, thank you all very, very much. Um, looks like, yeah, well, you're welcome, Chambi. We're, we're happy to be cool for you, my friend, uh, and we're happy to, to answer, I guess, any other questions in the Discord. Um, so... Here. We'll be here. Yes, exactly, Eric MG. <laughs> How Whoa. long did I take to write my first piece for Symphony from start to finish? Um, 
two months or so, the, the first one that oh. was an arrangement from scratch? I think mine was more like four to six months. I had initially conceived it as a brass quintet thing, and then I realized I have a way, way better opportunity uh, if I turn my arrangement of the Millennial Fair into a full orchestra thing. And uh, that was when I happened to join WMGSO, and um, that was a good choice because we ended up recording that on our first album. Eric, if you send me an arrangement, I will happily tell you why it's bad. I will also tell you why it's good. Because having seen your work in the past, I know that you are very good. <laughs> yeah. Aaron is right. Stop trying to arrange that. <laughs> For the Chris, I'll also point out that the first orchestral thing I wrote was adapting Mozart's Lacrimosa for our mm -hmm. instrumentation. So I started small. Yeah. That's why the first thing from scratch took two months, yeah. which might be short. Yes, generally speaking, a pretty quick turnaround of two months. All right. Well, I think that is, is all the time we have. I know we've got other, other panels coming up. So um... Yes, please stay tuned. And thank you again, everybody. See ya.